Right, let's kick off. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Jonathan. You'll find me on various online things as the JPster, um, except on Twitter, where I'm the real JPster because someone got there before me. Um, welcome to my talk about embedded Rust and the Monotron, this project that seems to have consumed so much of my life recently. So, uh, yeah, so on the, on the Twitters, I am the real JPster. On GitHub, I am the JPster. You can find loads of source code for loads of projects. Um, and all my crypto keys are on Keybase. So you can cryptographically prove I am who I say I am up to a point. So what are we doing in this talk? Well, this is, a, this is as I say, something that's occupied quite a lot of my time recently. You could call it an obsession. I imagine my wife would call it an obsession. Um, but this is about using the right tools to do the wrong thing. This is absolutely not an example of something I recommend you undertake. But hopefully, the process I've been through will be interesting and you'll learn something about the tools I used on the way. So this is a talk broken into five parts. We'll do about an hour of talking or so, split into four parts. I'm going to start talking about embedded Rust, um, why that's useful, how it differs to things like C++. I'm going to talk about the particular project, the Monotron, how we implemented that, and then basically how this project has just gone massively off the rails. Um, and it's a bit of self-therapy for me in the, in the last act. And then hopefully, fingers crossed, we will be able to put together a demo for you. Let's see how we go. So, who here has heard of the Rust programming language? And that, I think, you'll find is the highest definition rendering you'll see of the, uh, of the Rust logo. The, the very observant of you will have noticed I've done all of my slides as ASCII art. Uh, <laughs> it's a really bad idea and is an incredibly painful process. Don't do it. But for your benefit, I have produced some of the worst slides you are going to, uh, you are going to see at ACU this year. So this is uh, the logo for the Rust programming language. So yeah, it's this sort of LLVM-based um, sort of functional, sort of procedural language that inherits from lots of bits. I guess the, the short version is it's a, it's a programming language that tries to take the last 40 years of programming language development and says, can we just do something better than C, please? Um, and is a language you can write operating systems in, you can write bare metal code in, you can compile it to WASM and run it in your browser. Because it's based on an LVM, it targets all the popular CPU architectures. Um, it's been going for a, a few years now. Um, it started off mainly sort of on the, on the desktop, on the server side. It's now moving in into the web. Um, and my interest specifically is about um, embedded systems. This is the Rust embedded logo, again, rendered with spectacular fidelity. Um, so Rust embedded is a working group. The Rust programming language has a core team who work on the compiler and the language, and then they have working groups who look after various different areas. There's a, a working group for command line tools, there's a working group for networking, there's a working group for WASM, um, there's a working group for embedded. It started out as a group of uh, about four or five of us. Um, we would get together on IRC, um, Mozilla's IRC network, hash uh, Rust embedded, and then we'd have a, a Google video chat uh, once a month, just to catch up, see how we were going. Um, over the last year, it's fair to say it's grown a lot. Um, that process doesn't work. There's now um, dozens of people involved. The working group is split into sub-teams, so there's teams looking after specific CPU architectures. There's teams looking after portability, interoperability, um, hardware abstraction layer, which is something we'll, we'll talk about later. So it's definitely a, a community that's growing. Um, there's lots of um, materials available online. I've got flyers with me. I got overexcited at a previous event, and Vistaprint do this thing where they say, you can have twice as many flyers for only X pounds more. And you're like, well, that's, that makes them cheaper. Pay more money and they're cheaper, right? Yeah, great. So you'd click that button and it says, but you could have twice as many flyers for this much more money. Um, so I have one of my packs of 500 flyers. So <laughs> please do come get flyers afterwards. Yeah, so, so what's the idea with, with Rust Embedded? Well, it's about um, 
It's about running software on embedded systems, systems that only do this one job and you can't just sort of generally program them. Um, and that's sort of bare metal systems, maybe Linux systems that are in a router do a very specific function. And that's different to um, some of the programming you do on the, on the desktop, for example. The Rust embedded, um, certainly on the bare metal systems, you probably haven't got a memory allocator by default. You can implement one and stitch it in, but by default you haven't got that. Um, so that means you haven't got vector and string. You've got the sort of more basic types like slices. Um, and that presents some challenges. And people make a lot of assumptions when they write Rust code and they go, well, I've got these great quality collections, so I'm going to use them um, in my system. Uh, and then when the embedded people come along to try and reuse some of these excellent libraries, they go, oh, you know, you've made some assumptions that I would actually have memory available, and I haven't. Um, so the embedded team, the embedded working group, are trying to put together a library of software that is usable on all of these constrained platforms. So um, one thing that you may not have come across is Rust has now been split into editions. I guess it's like the difference between C++ 98, 03, 11, 17, and so on. Rust took that, that year numbering scheme and just, I think, at the very tail end of December 2018, they got the 2018 edition out of the door. And what that does, basically, is it says, look, stuff's been happening. Rust runs on a release train, so every six weeks there's a new version of the compiler. But you may have missed some of those incremental updates. So we're going to batch them all together, along with some, um, I think, breaking changes. I'll qualify that. Some breaking changes to the, to the language, and we'll package it up as Rust 2018. The reason I qualify the word breaking is the change it, Rust 2018 code is interoperable with Rust 2015 code. So all the existing stuff still works. And you can write new code and call 2015 code and vice versa. It's things like they wanted to make uh, await a keyword. If people have been creating variables called await, I can't suddenly make await a keyword because all of that old code will break. Rust has these stability guarantees. They always try to make sure the old code, if it worked on stable, it will keep working on the stable version of the compiler. So in 2018, they've been able to do things like take away await. So that's now a, a reserved keyword. It doesn't do anything yet, but they're going to need that for later. Um, so if you haven't looked at Rust recently, do have a look at what they've put into the Rust 2018 release, um, especially things around modules. Um, I think they've really neatened it up. So if you want to do some embedded Rust programming for your system, your system is going to need an LLVM backend. If you're using Extensa, um, the chip that's in an ESP32, uh, there is an LLVM backend, but it's in a fork. And Rust has a fork, so someone needs to get the two forks and merge them back together. And that hasn't happened yet. Uh, with Atmel's AVR chips, again, the AVR support is in a fork. That's being merged, is merged. That's in a slightly better condition. Um, but the, the main CPU architectures are on PowerPC MIPS. Um, they're, all, they're all good. You need a target file. A target file is something LLVM uses that says, look, integers are this wide. Um, these integers are, you know, are this wide. This is how the interrupts happen. This is the, the stack space you need to reserve. Um, the, comp the Rust compiler has a bunch of these targets built in, and we're adding more and more over time. Um, if you want to use a chip that's not in the Rust compiler, I'll give a specific example. The new Cortex-M33 from ARM, that processor core uses a new instruction set. They added some extra instructions. They call it some VAM. That wasn't in the Rust compiler. LLVM knew how to emit that machine code, but the Rust compiler didn't know that was a thing it could ask LLVM to do. So there's just a little file in JSON format, um, and we used those for a while, and eventually that was merged into the tree, and now you can create Cortex-M33 programs um, just fine. You also need a build of libcore. Um, the common platforms, certainly the ARM, uh, Cortex-M3, M4, and so on, the Rust team supply a pre-built libcore. Now, this makes things much easier because the difference between compiling Linux code and compiling code for my Cortex-M, it's just a, a one-line, um, an argument change when I call the, the build system and everything else happens magically. If you haven't got one of those pre-compiled standard libraries, uh, you're going to have to build it yourself, and that gets a little more complicated. Um, 
So if you can stick to the, the ARM Cortex-Ms for now, that's going to be a slightly easier introduction. So let's have a look uh, at see what some Rust code looks like in the embedded world. Hopefully, just about read that. We'll go through it line by line. Um, double slash comments, kind of used to those. Uh, let mute USB UART is, and we call some function that's going to create us a UART. So that is a serial port, a device we can use to talk to other devices. Um, this is p.uart0. That's actually um, a fairly raw object that represents the peripheral in our CPU. So that object has um, uh, memory mapped registers for the receive and the transmit buffers and the board rate control and a whole load of individual registers that do interesting stuff but are kind of fiddly and you don't really care if you just want to send some text. So that's a raw object that we actually auto-generate from um, manufacturer supplied chip definitions and we're wrapping it up. This serial function is going to take that, it's going to move it and the raw object is going to be no longer available. So someone can't fiddle with our board rate registers once this serial object has been created. We then take a couple of pins. Now this is one of the interesting examples of what they call um, zero size types. And it gives you these um, zero cost abstractions. And what that means is we can say nice things about the pins and the state they're in. In this case, I'm using pin PA1 and I have to put it in alternate function mode and I want it to be a push-pull pin. That is, it can drive current and sync current as opposed to being open drain or an input or anything like that. So we're going to put it into alternate function mode and I'm going to put it into alternate function mode one. This particular chip, each of these pins, this pin could be UART transmit or SPI transmit or maybe it could be a timer pin and I have to tell my CPU which mode I want my pin in. Now the clever thing is that this UART function is designed such that I can't pass it pins that don't make sense on this chip. If I swap these two lines over, the Rust compiler would say, no, that's not allowed. Pin PA0 does not implement UART0 transmit. So the compiler at compile time is verifying that my I.O. configuration is correct. And once it's satisfied itself of that information, all that stuff is thrown away doesn't occupy any space, there's no runtime cost, it's all been checked and thrown away, so we get high performance machine code as if we'd handwritten it, but with the safety of the system checking for us at compile time. Then um, we're not using uh, hardware handshaking, so those are empty, and the board rate. The board rate argument is not an int. In C, these would all be ints, and then if I put my board rate where my I.O. pin should be, C compiler's like, yep, Seems legit to me. Um, whereas in Rust, the board rate argument must be of type board rate. Um, but we can actually implement new functions on integer. So here's my board rate, 115200. It's a U32. And I can call dot BPS that turns it from an integer into a board rate. If I put that argument in the wrong field, the compiler's going to go, no, I was expecting an IO pin. That's a board rate. What do you do? And then finally, we need the clocks. Clocks are set when you... Embedded microprocessors are generally pretty complicated, and there's lots of different speeds things can run at. When you set that up, you get an object. It's called clocks in this case. I'm going to pass it in, and that's how it knows how to configure the serial port. If I reconfigure my chip to run at 8 megahertz instead of 16, the board rate will still be 115200 because it's working everything out. Um, sort of old-fashioned C code, if you change a hash to fine and you change your chip from 8 to 16 megahertz, you probably have to go and edit some board rate config somewhere else, otherwise everything will run half the speed or twice as fast. Whereas we can just do this all automatically. Let's have a look at another example. A really cute example of why closures are useful. This is a function that allows you to run functions uh, with interrupts disabled. Sometimes that's important if you're got an interrupt and you've got a main thread that are both accessing the same variable. If I access it from the main thread, I want to make sure my interrupts are turned off. So the function free uh, takes some f of type f and it returns an r, where f is a function. So basically this is a function that takes a function. What it's going to do is it's going to turn interrupts off, it's going to call my function f, and then it's going to turn interrupts back on again. And it literally doesn't matter how my function f exits. I can do all the nice things in Rust with try and return early if things are errored. 
it doesn't matter what happens, the interrupts are always going to get turned back on. In C code, this is much more complicated um, because you can say, okay, I'm going to turn my interrupts off, do a bunch of stuff. Oh, I failed to do that, so I'm going to bail out early. And oh, I forgot to turn interrupts back on, and now my system is broken. At compile time, the Rust compiler will actually inline the function you pass. You could even pass a closure because it's a, it's a fun one. So you could pass a closure in for F with like a lambda in C++, and it will all get inlined. So this effectively all dissolves, and you just have interrupts off, do my stuff, turn interrupts back on again. So another example of safety that comes without a runtime cost. The critical section object um, is cute. You can have operations that say, I'm going to take a critical section as an argument, and creating critical sections is considered an unsafe thing. You shouldn't just be creating a critical section randomly in the middle of your source code. It's only safe to create one if you've got interrupts turned off in this case. So that's why we create a critical section, but with this unsafe keyword. Unsafe just means, trust me, I know what I'm doing. The compiler has got a bunch of invariants that it needs to uphold, and creating a critical section is likely to bust a load of those invariants. invariants. So you simply have to say, it's all right, I've checked this. Scout's honor, you know, I've checked it, it's fine, trust me. I'm allowed to create a critical section here, which is fine because interrupts are disabled. Here's another example of accessing memory mapped I.O. This is for the cache and branch predictor module, I think in a Cortex M4. Um, basically, we create a function called new that creates a new object. Uh, the object has one member variable, and it's of type phantom data, which sounds very exciting. But basically, phantom data is a placeholder that says, here's a thing. I want you to pretend there's a thing here. Otherwise, you'd shout at me for not using some type argument, for example. But at compile time, it's zero size, so it disappears. So it's basically just saying to the compiler, I'm doing a thing. I know what I'm doing. So our, our object just has a phantom data, and then it has a, a PTR method that gets us the address. And register block is a struct that describes all the memory map registers. Um, the neat thing that Rust gives us is this deref trait. We say impl, it means we're going to implement a trait. It's like an, an abstract um, interface. The deref trait um, says there is a method called deref. Um, and what, what Rust does is it, it will dereference um, references. So in C world, it will put stars in front of things automatically. In C, if you try and say some pointer dot something, the compiler goes, nope. You have to put a star in front of it, and we'll use the, the arrow. Rust will actually deref things automatically and go, OK, that didn't work because it's a reference, and you call the method on a reference. Let me put a star in front of it and dereference it for you. Oh, yeah, now I can call a method, and that's fine. The cute thing is when you implement deref and return a different type, this now means I can have a reference, but I can call methods on it that are actually defined on a different type. And when I call that method, Rust goes, that method doesn't exist. Let me see if I could deref it. What does it deref into? Oh, it derefs into a register block. Does this method exist on register block? Yes, it does. OK, now it'll work. The upshot of this is you get to call methods and access the fields in the register block without carrying around an object that has a size, because this object is zero sized. So I get to call various methods and access fields in my cache and branch predictor but basically at no runtime cost. I don't have to have this object I move around. I have a, a, an object um, in the source code, but because it's zero sized, there's no cost. And the, the address access all just gets inlined. So how do I get started with a Rust project? Well, I just type cargo new my project. If you haven't um, seen much Rust, it's terribly pun laden. The reusable modules of Rust code are called crates, and Cargo is the tool we use to build the crates. So you say Cargo new my project, it creates you a, a project. You can then edit some parameters to tell it to build for, uh, for say, an ARM Cortex-M. Or you can go on GitHub, clone the Cortex-M quick start project, and that will just, just build that and straight out of the box. You've got a Cortex-M binary you can load onto your chip. Um, and run it. And it actually uses some of the Cortex-M debugging features to get, um, to get text out. So it's actually usable. There's also a, a tool called Cargo Generate, 
which will pull in um, projects like Cortex M Quick Start, um, but it will, it will go through a, a template process and it will say, oh, there's a template for author, I'll put in your author name. There's a template for project name, I will ask you, what do you want to call this project? Um, so if you've got Cargo Generate installed, that could be a slightly quicker way of, of getting set up. But it's, it's pretty straightforward to get set up. One of those options will work. Um, you type Cargo Build and it will, it will build your binary for you. I come from a C background and it's generally pretty fiddly to get embedded software development going. I've got to go and get tools from here. I've got to go and get the C compiler from ARM because the one that Ubuntu give me is not new enough. Uh, now I've got to go and get GDB and I need a whole bunch of other stuff and maybe support files for my chip manufacturer to go download those. Here, we can just package it all up. We can use these modules um, to make things more reusable. So hardware abstraction layers, the HAL. What the HAL does is it describes common peripherals you might find an embedded chip in a generic way. It says, here is some trait serial, and serial ports have a read method, which returns a byte, and they have a transmit method, which takes a byte and might return an error. And that's literally all you need to know to use a serial port. The implementation is probably more fiddly. You're probably writing to FIFOs or whatever. But if I'm writing a piece of code that simply wants to use a serial port, maybe I want to talk to a, uh, an AT modem or whatever it is I want to do, I don't care about that. I just need to know that there's a, a receive and a transmit. So we've created in the embedded working group this embedded HAL that describes various types of hardware. And I say, some crates will use the HAL. Uh, so here there's a, a HAL trait for SPI. Um, that's sort of a high-speed serial interface. Um, with a clock, so I can create uh, a function in my object that says I'm going to take some new, uh, call the function new, and it takes some variable called SPI of type S, and you can pass literally any S, provided S implements the SPI full duplex trait, and then I can I can implement um, that uh, that how I can create objects that implement the full duplex trait. Um, and I might have one for you know, a particular chip, maybe a Texas Instruments Tiva. I could implement full duplex for, for Tiva SPI. I could implement full duplex for, I don't know, some Linux dev object. And now I can run code on my Linux machine that uses an entry dev SPI, and then I can run the same code on my ARM microcontroller, and as far as the driver's concerned, you know, like an SD card driver or a temperature sensor, all that code is exactly the same on my Linux box and on my Windows box. If I had, you know, if it's serial, I could implement, a, implement that for serial on Windows or my embedded system. Makes it much easier to debug because the code is completely portable. You know, my driver doesn't care how the bytes get to my peripheral. I just have receive and transmit or whatever it is you need for SPI. It's really powerful. We have examples for serial ports. I squared C, it's useful for temperature sensors, real-time clocks. SPI is good for um, higher speed devices like SD cards. Um, we have house for timers and so on. There's more work to be done. We're always grateful for volunteers to come along and say, I'm interested in controlling ethernet chips, or I'm interested in temperature sensors, or whatever it is you want to do. If we can help you do your work in a portable way, then everyone else gets to take advantage of it. If you have a look online for a thing called the awesome embedded Rust list, you find lists of loads of drivers for loads of chips written against the HAL, and all you need to do is implement the HAL for your microcontroller, and you get to take advantage of all these drivers out of the box. So as I alluded to there, you can run this code on a Linux machine. So there's an the example, implement SPI full duplex for Linux dev. Really powerful. You can also, um, set these things called features. And this is a bit like using macros in the preprocessor. You can, in your project definition, say, I've got some feature called, um, I don't know, it might be called uh, use std. So that, there's actually two standard libraries, I should say that, one called core and one called std, or standard. And standard has got things like uh, fancy console printing and all the memory allocation, and core doesn't. It's the small subset for embedded systems. 
So you can write your code. So it mostly uses core, but there's a bit of debug. And I can add a feature. And if I build it with double dash feature equals add extra super debug, all the bits labeled with CFG feature brackets add super debug, all the debug stuff gets built in. Otherwise, I can build it out. That's, that's pretty powerful. I've, I've used that to, to get extra debug in when I'm so do unit tests on Linux that I know I don't need when they're on the ARM system. So that is Act 1. Now we're going to talk about the Monotron. And then we'll get to the demo. So uh, is this familiar to anyone? The Commodore 64 is a computer I had when I was a kid, hence the T-shirt. It's so immediate. You turn it on, a second later, which if CRT sorted itself out, you can type code. You just, you can read the book and give it instructions and it will do things. Imagine if your Windows machine booted up to a Python prompt. It'd be so much more um, interesting, so much easier to get in, rather than having to go onto websites and download stuff and know things. You just turn it on and it appears. I wanted to get back to that world. And I wanted, I wanted something that was small. I find that there is, there is art, there is joy to be found in doing as much as you can with as little as possible. There is, um, there is an art to be found in meeting constraints. Uh, the famous example, I think this is attributed to Ernest Hemingway, but there's some debate as to whether you actually said it. Someone said, can you write a, a story in six words? And they said, no, it can't be done. For sale, baby shoes, never worn. And that's a great example of doing a lot with very little. If someone said I had to write a novel, 100,000 words, fill me with terror. If someone said I had to landscape 300 acres of country park, would fill me with terror. Small urban garden, a haiku, a poem, six word story. It's, it's not easy, but it feels manageable. It feels approachable. And once you're done, I think you can see more beauty because of the constraints you were placed in. This is basically a long way of saying, I really like embedded systems, and I think a megabyte of RAM is wasteful, frankly. What are you doing? The fact that I have to install a Slack client on my PC, which seems to require two gigabytes of RAM for a text interface, I'm pretty sure I could have done on a Commodore 64, really winds me up, but that's a talk for another day. So I created this project basically to distract me, and I wanted to know, can you generate video? I picked that as a random example. Here's a Cortex microcontroller. Can I make it generate pictures? That's a sort of a really immediate thing. I can see those pictures on my telly, show them to my kids. Look, it's doing a thing. That's what I wanted to know. And basically, how much can we squeeze out of these incredibly small constraints? So I had a look at some boards. Uh, you've got the STM32 F7 Discovery. Really nice board for 50 quid. Loads of peripherals on it. Uh, would you like to see a photograph of it? There's a photograph of the uh, <laughs> STM F7 Discovery. I mean, it looks pretty much exactly like that. Um, but th this big thing on the top of it is a big LCD. And if you buy a board that's already got an LCD on it, well, that's job done. That's cheating. We're finished. We can go home. My project is over. This is rubbish. Here is another board. I happen to have one of these. The Cortex M4, 80 megahertz. It's about 12 quid, 32K of RAM, only a quarter of a meg of flash, and literally no useful peripherals for generating video. <laughs> Looks almost exactly like this. Um, it's red, you can't quite see the red, but there's a USB port at the bottom, some buttons at the, down here. Uh, there's actually two copies of the same chip. One of them, TI, supply pre-programmed as a JTAG USB debug chip, and the other one you get to program, which means this board is brilliant. I don't need a programmer, just plug it into my laptop, and I can write um, code straight away. It's great, that's 12 quid. I need to spend more than that on a USB debug module normally. I thought about making PCBs and putting these chips down. Literally not worth the effort. Just give TI the 12 quid. Great board. So video. How do we generate this analog video? Old-fashioned CRTs, they're saying, I'm alarmed every time I do this talk, there's fewer and fewer people in the audience who were probably around when we had. <laughs> In the olden days, ask your parents, we used to sit in front of a particle accelerator <laughs> which accelerated electrons directly at your face. 
but they crashed into a piece of glass covered with nasty chemicals and they glowed whenever the electrons hit them. And then we use magnets to wave this particle accelerated beam across the screen. And it went from left to right, and as it went along, it lit up. And if you change the brightness of that beam, you change the brightness of the screen as it lit up. So it would go across, and then on the end, on this right-hand side, there's an area called horizontal blanking. And this is basically a period of time that the beam needs to get back over to the other side where it started, where it drops down and it goes across again. So we fill the screen line by line, left to right, and then there's this blanking period where it's literally the beam is blanked because it's going back. If you left the beam turned on, then you'd be sort of scanning left and right across the screen and it would be a mess. So you go left to right, turn it off, go back again. And then there's a, a similar bit at the bottom called vertical blanking. And getting a functioning picture, like the projector is doing, I mean, even with HDMI, this is sort of how the system works, you need to get the timing correct. You need to scan from left to right in so many microseconds, spend so many microseconds with the signals off, so many frames per second, the monitor measures all this and goes, yep, I know what you're doing. So it's all about the timing. It's an amazing website. tinyvga.com slash VGA timing is really useful because someone has taken all the common resolutions and explained in words even I can understand what the, what the measurements are. So remember, this is an 80 megahertz board I'm using. That's important. So if you want to generate standard VGA, which is not bad for a sort of retro computer, it basically works out at 25.175 megahertz. 640 times the 480 with the blanking. I can't generate a 25.175 megahertz clock out of 80. That just it doesn't divide. Not going to work. Can't do that. Um, when you boot up your DOS machine or your Windows machine with an old-fashioned BIOS, that first screen that comes up, might say a Ward BIOS or whatever, um, is actually 720 by 400 resolution at 70 hertz. Slightly different. Different clock frequency, 28.322. Not going to work. Can't divide that out of 80. Going through the list. 800 by 600 at 60 hertz. 40.000 megahertz. Well, I think we have a winner. 80 divided by 2, there's my 40 megahertz pixel clock. So all I have to do is generate a new pixel every two clock cycles, and I can generate a picture. So, okay, I can, I can cheat a bit. If I, if I halve the horizontal resolution and do it 400 by 600, then I get four clock cycles for every pixel. That I can probably work with. I did try the two clock cycle version. Doesn't work. So what are we going to do? We need to generate these pixels, but what are they going to look like? So if you want to do black and white, we said the beam scans across the screen. Well, here's the, the blanking period. Switched it over to the other side, because that's normally where it's represented. This little pulse where it goes low, that's called a sync period. That tells the monitor, get ready, there's a line coming. And it looks for that pulse, and that's how all the left-hand edge of the monitor lines up. If you didn't have that, the left-hand edge wouldn't line up, and it would be a mess. And then this sort of dotty bit, that's data. The brightness can be naught or 1, or somewhere in the middle if you're supporting gray. Otherwise, it's just a black and white. And then all you have to do is bob the line up and down at 40 megahertz, and the monitor will sample it. Or if it's a case of a CRT, it doesn't even sample it, it just feeds that signal straight into the, the particle accelerator, um, and you get a picture. And then if you want a color picture, well, there's, there's an infinite number of colors, but of course, we only care about the three good colors, red, green, and blue, because that's basically lines up with our eyes. The red is largely invisible. Sorry about that. It's much better on the screen down here. Um, but red, green, and blue. You can see the, the green there, clearly. Uh, so all we have to do is do the same thing, but do it three times. Oh, great, hang on a minute. So I had four clock cycles to generate every pixel, but now I actually have to generate three pixels, a red one, a green one, and a blue one. Well, and I'm not actually sure this is doable. If you take 400 pixels across by 600 pixels high, and if we say, look, I'm only going to do three bits per pixel, so I could do red, green, blue. If you multiply all that out, you get a number that is about twice the size of the RAM I've got on this chip. It's not going to fit. So the solution is text mode. And this is, um, this is how you know, DOS machines would work. 
They use a font. The font is a collection of tiny bitmaps baked into a ROM. The application doesn't have to supply those. A letter A is a letter A. Don't care what the letter A looks like as long as it looks letter A-ish. So someone else supplies the font, and all my code has to do is say, I want an A here, followed by a B, followed by a C. And then the renderer goes, you wanted an A. I know what A's look like. And it goes and gets the pixels from somewhere else. It means the amount of memory I need to use, much smaller, much more manageable. Then, and this is the, the, the first um, health warning, you can get really sidetracked worrying about the differences between 8-bit code pages and Unicode. Very briefly, a long time ago, the Americans decided that 8 bits was enough to describe a number. Actually, they thought 7 bits was enough to describe, uh, sorry, a, a character. Um, there's some control codes, A to Z, A to Z, upper and lower case, numbers, bit of punctuation, who cares about foreign people, job done. Um, I mean, most people store numbers as 8 bits, so oh, actually I've got a whole other set of 128 I can use. So people in Europe went, great, we can use this other half of the character set for all of our letters. And then people in other countries around the world went, well, we can use the top half for our letters. So people in Russia put some acrylic characters in the top half, and people in Poland put different letters, and Bulgaria, and all Hungary, all kinds of places. Never mind Japan and China, goodness knows how that would even work. Um, it got very complicated, and basically, if you had a character, number 200, it would look completely different on a Greek person's machine as it would a Russian person's machine. And so the Unicode consortium came along and went, we're going to give a number to literally all the characters, a universal coding system for letters and characters. Don't even get me started on the difference between a letter, a character, a grapheme, a code point. Um, it's really complicated. I've tried to dial it back for this project. I'm doing 8-bit characters, and I picked code page 850, Western Europe, and that's literally what I've done. Unicode, no. Which, which is a problem, because Rust is a Unicode native programming language. <laughs> <laughs> and all, all the strings are stored in UTF-8 internally. So, yeah, there's, there's some graphical glitches in places, uh, certainly when you run it on, on Linux. But, Let's, let's not get into that. So you could do a whole other talk on that. So all I have to do now is I put letter A in memory, ASCII 65, whatever it is. I have to go and get the A bitmap from my font. Go, where am I in the bitmap? I'm in the middle, so that I've got to put these pixels on the screen. Get them out, and I've got four clock cycles per pixel. Here's what my font might look like. This is eight by eight. And we see I've got some lit up in green and some a blank, and that's sort of a copyright symbol. That's a circle-ish. If you've only got eight by eight, that's a circle. Um, so here's my copyright symbol. But I've got a choice. You know, is this green and black? Or maybe I've got white text on a blue background. Maybe I want yellow text on a red background. In which case, all of these greens need to be yellow, and all of these empty spaces need to be red. And of course, yellow is not a real color. It's a mixture of red and green. So what I actually have is everything's red, and then some bits have got extra green added. That's quite a lot of maths I have to do now. If every character can have a different color combination, I've now got to go to the font, get the letter A, work out which pixels I'm lighting up, and go, OK, they wanted a green foreground and a magenta background because they have, they have basically my artistic taste, which is to say zero. And I've got to do all the maths to work out which of the reds, the greens, and the blues I'm lighting up because I have to emit a red pixel, a green pixel, and a blue pixel for each one of these squares, and I get four clock cycles to do it. And I'm trying to do it in Rust, so I can't even like, do hand-optimized assembler. So that was the idea. Should we have a look, see how it worked? Here's a piece of source code. I'm not going to go through it in detail, but simply to say, I'm using iterators. Hooray, we have iterators. I can iterate through a slice for character and attribute in row.glyphs.iter. I have a slice. It contains tuples. Each tuple is a character and attribute pair, and I'm iterating through them. This is the fastest way to go through a slice. If you wrote an old-fashioned for loop like you would in C, it's actually slower. The Rust compiler knows that iterators can't go off the end of the array. All the bounds checks get deleted. If I do it the old-fashioned way with an integer index, the Rust compiler has to double-check me at runtime, and everything gets slower. 
So use high performance collections like iterators, they're faster. Uh, then what I'm doing is I'm working out where I am in the, the character, uh, calculating my index, and I'm doing a bunch of unsafe stuff. Because basically I was indexing into the font, and the Rust um, compiler was adding bounds checks. Hey, you may have asked for a character that's off the end of the font, and that will be undefined, so I'm going to check that for you and save you from yourself. Which is really nice of it, but I've only got four clock cycles for every pixel I'm trying to transmit. So I have pulled out my favorite keyword, the shut up and leave me alone, I know what I'm doing keyword, and I'm doing pointer maths, and it's all marked with unsafe. So basically I've got a pointer to my font table, I'm computing the index, doing the lookup, and saying, shut up, it's fine. And this works. This is fast enough on a Cortex M4 in black and white. Color, it turns out, is a real nightmare. I'm going to take a drink. So again, you probably can't see it, but there are in fact three different colored blocks on this screen. There's a red one, a green one, and a blue one, but they're not lined up. If you try and emit a red pixel, a green pixel, and a blue pixel from this processor, I'm using the SPI peripherals, incidentally, I took the SPI peripheral, you designed to plug it into an SD card or something, I've plugged it into a monitor, deleted the clock, and I'm just bashing pixels out. I can't send a red, a green, and a blue simultaneously. They're different peripherals, and I have to do an individual memory write for each, so I can do the red or the green. And if I do red followed by green, they're one clock cycle apart. Well, that's quarter of a pixel. And now, I get fringing effects. So every time I try to print something that's white, what I get is something that's white, is red, then yellow, then white, then cyan, then magenta, or blue on the end. Because my red, green, and blue have sort of smeared. They're not in phase. A nightmare. I literally spent weeks, if not months, of evenings thinking about how I could fix this. And I have managed to fix it. The trick, it turns out, is deeply unpleasant, and I'm slightly ashamed, but it does work. The trick is to start the red, if I do my characters as eight bits, then basically I'm throwing a byte at the SPI peripheral for each character. If I start the red two bytes early and clock out blank, I can then use no ops, there is one piece of handwritten assembler in here, I can then use the correct number of no ops to delay the correct number of processor cycles, then I can do the green one byte early, transmit blank, then a bunch of no ops to line everything up, and then do the blue, they will all be in phase. Just about. Um, assuming the compiler doesn't do anything clever and reorder stuff, and it turns out the no ops, it's really important you mark them as volatile, otherwise the compiler will go, I'm gonna line all these up for you down here at the end. <laughs> no, I put them there for a reason. Um, so yeah, if you, because the, the SBIs are buffered, I then have enough time to go and put the red, the green, and the blue bytes in a byte at a time, and it does all, it all lines up. <coughs> Would you like to see a demo? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, this is tricky, because it involves some video switching. Don't panic, video people at the back, it's going to be okay. I'm going to have to uh, unplug uh, PowerPoint and then plug it. Uh, should we leave the demo to the end? Would that be better? No, I'm, I'm just messing with you. You're actually watching the Monotron as we speak. This is a slideshow program <laughs> I wrote for the Monotron, and this entire presentation has been generated by the Cortex M4 that's sat on this desk at 800 by 600 at 60 hertz. Um, so. So now I hope you forgive me for the appalling quality of the ASCII art. Um, so, we've got a computer, it can generate video. Great, if that's literally all it can do, then that's sort of a three minute YouTube demo, it's not that interesting. We need to connect it to other things, like a keyboard maybe. Turns out keyboards, tiny computers. They've got a microprocessor inside with RAM and ROM and they listen to all the keys and send messages down the cable. It turns out 
they're non-trivial computers, and it's actually quite tricky to speak the protocol that keyboards use. If it's USB, that's really hard. That's a complicated spec, and I'm doing everything from scratch in Rust, remember? If it's PS2, like these old Dell keyboards, um, it's still it's a, it's a complicated signal. Um, and so I cheated. For the first six months or so of this system's life, I just couldn't do keyboard support. But it comes with USB support for free. Remember, it's got that JTAG chip at the top. Well, that does USB serial conversion. So I just plug it into my PC, load up my favorite serial terminal. I can type in the serial terminal on my laptop. And as long as I don't look at the laptop screen, because nothing's happening, and I look at the telly, then it sort of feels like I'm typing and stuff's coming up on the. So that's, that's how it operated. OK, so now I can type and I can do stuff and I've got pictures. Uh, I need a command line interface. Remember that Commodore 64 it came up with the basic prompt? Something like that that says, I am here, I am ready for you. You may give me instructions. So, uh, and a read, evaluate, print loop. It's quite nice. So I can type in maths and it gives me answers. I can type, tell it to do stuff and it will do things. It's interesting. Turns out, yeah, not, not that easy. Couldn't find one that pre-existed. I could implement some form of basic. I thought my kids might use this system. I really didn't want them to learn about line numbers and go to. If, as long as, if they just never know that they existed, wouldn't that be better? So I, I thought about this a lot. I'm, I haven't brought myself to implement a basic yet. More on that later. So I've got a little um, simple menu system. I can create items of different types, submenus and callbacks. Uh, here's a Rust tagged enumeration. So I've got a callback, it takes an argument. Beep, that's a function. Uh, the command is called beep, and there's some help text. So if I type help beep, it tells me help text, and I can, I can run it. So I can do simple commands. It's not quite a basic, but I can, I can drive it. I can put stuff on the screen. I can run demos. I can poke the system, literally implemented peek and poke. Um, and that's enough to sort of get it going. So I've got stuff on the screen, and I can poke it, and I can display numbers. PS2 keyboards. I said the PS2 keyboards were complicated. They were tiny computers. The reason this is complicated is there's basically two wires that come out of the keyboard. And if you've never looked into this, you should. It's fascinating. Um, there's two wires, a clock wire. The clock is generated by the keyboard, not the computer. So the keyboard is generating the clock signal which means the computer has to respond every time the clock signal changes. I think it's from low to high. And the signals are, uh, the data signal is bi-directional. I need to send messages to the keyboard to get the num light, num lock light to turn on. That doesn't turn on because the keyboard wants to turn it on. That turns on because the computer told it to turn on, and the data line is bi-directional. So if you hold the clock line low, because they're open collector, then the keyboard goes, oh, you want to talk to me. I will wait for another line to change, and then the keyboard sends clocks, and the computer sends data in the other direction. It's basically all really complicated. But the short version is oh, scan codes. You thought ASCII and Unicode was complicated. This keyboard generates scan code set two for reasons, but your PC internally translates it into scan code set one because it still thinks it's an IBM XT from 1984. Um, XTs, of course, not having the numeric keypad. And DOS was written to expect the shorter keyboard with the different scan code set. So most operating system guides don't know about scan code set 2 because your PC has internally translated it. Ugh, is all I can say about that. And anyway, the clock rate is 10 kilohertz. And I'm trying to draw video here. I'm kind of busy. I've only got four clock cycles for every pixel. And you're interrupting me at 10 kilohertz. I can't do it. But I tried, and every time I typed, the screen wobbled, which had a, it had a nice sort of ZX80 aesthetic to it, but wasn't that practical. So I parked keyboard support. Um, joysticks, however, joysticks are nice. Uh, NES, anyone have a Nintendo when they were a kid? Uh, NES is kind of complicated, actually. There's sort of a weird serial protocol like the keyboards. Atari joysticks, super simple. Four leaf switches, up, down, left, right, and a fire button. And they're all connected to ground when they're activated. So I need five I.O. pins, and my joystick will work. Um, Sega Master System, exactly the same, but there's an extra fire button. Commodore 64, exactly the same, only has one fire button. Amigas, 
CD32 starts to get a bit weird. Uh, Sega Mega Drive, they wanted A, B, and C and start. That's more buttons and inputs that we've got pins on the nine-way connector. So they actually have a control signal that comes from the computer that basically selects button set A or button set B. So one of them is like up, down, A, B, and the other is up, down, left, right, C, start. A bit more complicated. But anyway, Master System joypads, well, they're all right. Atari joysticks, they look okay. I could implement that. And I can make a simple game, Space Invaders or something. So how does the memory look on this system? So we've got ROM at the bottom, we've got RAM at the top. On a Cortex-M, the ROM starts at zero, the RAM starts at eight, mumble, mumble. I have literally no idea how to pronounce hexadecimal numbers because I don't often talk to other people about them. What, what, what do you call eight and seven zeros? Because I, honestly, I internally just call it eight million. And it's literally not eight million, that just couldn't be more wrong. But yeah, it's eight and, it's half a four gig, it's two gig. Anyway, eight and something uh, is where the RAM is. So we've got our sections. If you saw Hello World from scratch the other day, that was a brilliant talk, really interesting. But here are the sections, vector table, text, that's my code, my read-only data, my data, all lives in my flash ROM chip, I've got 256K, I've got a bit of data, a bit of zero initialized data, that's the screen buffer and stuff like that, and then there's 24K left at the top. So out of my 32K system, I'm using 8K for stack and system stuff, and I've got 24K left. So I could put applications in there, and if I can find some way for my C code to talk to my operating system, because um, this demo, as you can see, is starting to spiral out of control, um, then I could sort of load apps and they can do stuff and print to the screen. To do that, I need a, an interface, an ABI, Linux that would be syscalls, and Windows they use one of their C libraries, um, one of their pre-supplied libraries to talk to the kernel. Um, here is the interface I have defined. At the bottom of RAM, um, of the application RAM, you need to supply a four-byte value which is a pointer to your init function, and the rest of the RAM, I literally don't care what you do with it. You can remap the vector table, code, data, const, whatever you want, not bother, as long as those first four bytes point to where I need to jump to, we're all good. What I will pass your init function is a structure of function pointers, and this will let you do stuff. And the things we can do, put char, eight-bit characters, Remember, because this is simple, uh, we can put a character on the screen. I can track the cursor position, move everything along. For some reason, put char returns int. Oh, why does it need to return int? I, I don't know, maybe just is what it is. Uh, puts uh, takes a string, null terminated. Try and work out how to get Rust to do null terminated strings. It's fun. Anyway, puts um, prints a string, a whole sequence of characters until it gets to a null. Again, it returns int. Uh, read C, I can read characters from the keyboard, so now I can write programs that listen from the keyboard and print stuff. And Wait for vertical blanking interval. I'm spending most of my CPU time drawing the screen. The processing, so the actual program only gets to run in the vertical blanking interval, which is sort of this small section of time at the bottom. Out of my 80 megahertz CPU, I've effectively only got five megahertz left because 75 megahertz, roughly, is spent drawing the screen. So wait for vertical blanking interval just means wait until the CPU gets here, right at the very bottom, and then I'm safe to update the screen. I can redraw the characters, and it won't blur or smear or tear on the screen, because the, there's nothing being drawn at that moment. So that's a very useful call. I can say, has a key been pressed? Missing from the POSIX specification, you have to use n-curses, awful. It's really useful. Has anyone pressed a key? No. Then I will carry on rendering my game. Has anyone pressed a key? Yes. Well, let's check what they pressed. It's not read a key and wait forever until a key's pressed, because guess what? I've got music to play. I've got animations to run. I've got stuff to do. So KB hit, really useful. And then I can move the cursor around. Um, sound. Well, sound would be interesting, wouldn't it? We can make it beep, square waves. It's not too bad. Well, we can have a a play function that takes some frequency and, you know, plays beats. Font. Interesting. I've got a font. It's in the flash chip. But if I had different fonts, 
maybe I could have a graphics font. Or, as it had turned out, I implemented a teletext font. So teletext, um, that sort of old-fashioned video system you had in your telly with text, that's got a very special font. It's A to Z and some numbers, and the rest are sort of blocky graphics. And each character is actually made of six individual pixels. And they allocate 64 characters for those 64 combinations of pixels. And that's how they did the, like, the little pixely weather maps and um, uh, what was it? Bamboozle, that quiz on Channel 4 with the red, green, yellow, blue buttons. That was all made of characters, but each character had a different number of pixels set. Anyway, you can change the font and you can do that sort of thing. And you can read the joystick. So with this, you can sort of write applications like this slideshow, in fact, which is just a, a monotron application written using this API. Um, and this is a bug because I put too many bullet points on the screen. The last one, uh, set cursor visible. See, the screen has actually scrolled slightly. You can turn the cursor on and off. You're doing a slideshow. I don't want a blinking cursor on the screen. It's kind of distracting. So we mentioned audio. Square wave. I just want it to go burp, like a BBC or something like that, PC speaker. Just generate a square wave, generate it at different frequencies. That's all right. Remember that horizontal blanking interval? So I spend most of my time drawing the screen. Actually, there's a little bit of a microsecond left at the end of the screen. Turns out it's enough to do a little bit of maths. I can't just do square waves. I could do pulse width modulation. If I change the amount of time it's on and off, and then I run it through a capacitor as a low pass filter, I can actually generate a different volume level. I'm not just limited to on and off. I've actually got eight bit samples that I can play. And so I can do basic tunes because I wrote a three-channel wavetable synthesizer, which runs in the horizontal blanking interval. And interestingly, I developed all of this on my Linux laptop uh, using Pulse Audio. And then I just recompiled the code to run on a Cortex-M4, wired it up with an experiment, experimental amplifier using a, a schematic someone literally put on the back of an envelope for me. Um, Instead of the samples going to Pulse Audio, I sent them to the PWM output, and I swear it played a tune the first time I tried it. For me, that's what the Rust compiler does. All those bugs I'd fixed in Linux, I happened to be on an, on an airplane uh, when I did it, I'd fixed them all. I knew the wavetable was working correctly and playing the square waves and the sawtooth. So I got to the hotel room, I simply flashed the board, tried it, worked first time. Storage. Three and a half inch disks. A lot of people would tell you they store 1.44 megabytes. They are incorrect for every single definition of megabyte. It's actually 1,440 kibibytes, binary kilobytes, because it's double 720. You can't take a number, in, sorry, this is a personal hobby horse, you can't take a number in binary kilobytes, kibibytes, and divide it by a thousand. All kinds of wrong. The 1.38 mega binary megabytes, megabytes, or 1440. Anyway, disks, storage. Computer's going to need to load some stuff if I'm going to pretend it's a real computer. Basically, disks are out of the question. You know, I could go and get a Commodore 64 disk drive. Um, has a serial interface, but they're mainly all broken now. They don't work. Um, they're very expensive. Floppy disks are almost impossible to get. Um, so we're going to use SD cards. Fortunately, SD cards are still formatted like it's 1983 and we've got an IBM PC because they still use Microsoft's file allocation table. This is a mixed blessing. It's really inefficient and old, but it turns out it's quite simple to implement. There's a partition table. My master boot record says I have one partition. People don't partition SD cards. That would be weird. Um, and then in my partition, I have my volume boot record, my BIOS parameter block, my file allocation table. That's basically just a big map that tells you which bits of the disk have been used, which bits haven't been used, and what order all the blocks go in for a file. So there'll be an entry in the root directory that says the file starts at six. If I look in the FAT at six, it'll say seven. And if I look in the FAT at seven, it might say nine. If I look in the FAT at nine, it might say 322. If I look in the FAT at 322, it might say, this is the end of the file. 
And that's how I know how to arrange all the blocks on disk. The blocks are generally 512 bytes in size, which is useful because I can fit that in RAM. And so SD cards, 512 byte blocks, pinout is pretty straightforward. This chip has four SPI peripherals. I'm using one for red, one for green, one for blue, and there's a spare one, as luck would have it. So I just wire it up to the SD card. Actually, if you just wire it up to the SD card, it's really unreliable. It turns out they require pull-up resistors, and you must have resistors connecting each of the lines to 3.3 volts, otherwise random stuff happens. I mean, rust can save you from a lot of things, but it can't save you from electrical noise. Um, and there's no point trying to debug that, because it ain't gonna help. And SD cards are really cheap. They're like a couple of quid for eight gig. That's incredible. And because this is Rust and I'm writing reusable modules, it's online. Embedded SDMMCRS is a library I wrote. So where are we at? Well, let's go quickly through my descent into madness and let's go into the actual demo. So I built a Vera board because well, this collection of breadboard was really ropey. And every time I took it somewhere, it broke, uh, which was okay, but it's still a bit unreliable. So I went, I know, I'm gonna make a PCB. Turns out designing a PCB is hard. It takes a lot of time because you can just finesse it and polish it to the nth degree. And it's basically an open-ended project, as we will see. If you want to come and see me later, before we go into the break, I've got the PCB here, it's running. You can come and have a look at the many connectors I foolishly decided to add. It's kind of fun. I learned how to use KiCad, sent my PCBs off to China to get made. So, serial port. We said we've got USB serial, but I wanted to plug in a serial mouse, maybe, an old-fashioned modem. The connector, by the way, it's not a DB9. Another one of my personal hobby horses, bear with me. Uh, DB25 was the original serial connector. The B is the size of the D shell. It's the long, wide one with 25 pins. That's a DB. The short one with only nine pins in, that's not a DB. B is the big one, that's a DE. It should be a DE9 but they'd already got these computers with DB25 serial ports. So when the nine pin one came along where they went, well, that's the same, we'll just change the 25 for a nine. It's not right. It almost annoys me as much as 1.44 megabyte floppy. Anyway, DE9 serial ports, they're plus minus 15 volts. Oh, no, this is really, I've only got five volts. How do I generate plus minus 15? Well, you go and get a chip, you know, a max 323 level shifter and it needs a bunch of capacitors to build up charge and you can generate the voltages. Anyway, the basic serial port, receive, transmit, ground. I can do uh, handshaking as well, so you know when you can transmit or not transmit, because my CPU's kind of busy most of the time, so most of the time it's going, mm, <laughs> don't talk to me, I'm busy. Uh, and then there's extra pins for data terminal ready and data set ready, and then ring indicator and data carry. Literally no idea what these pins do. Um, they're not connected. You really only need receive and transmit, and then the two handshaking pins if you really want to show off. Um, but that's enough to hook up to an old modem, an Iridium modem, a sort of an old fashioned 56K Hayes modem, maybe a serial mouse, I could try that, I haven't tried it. Or I did send out a tweet that said I'd managed to get the Rust compiler working on a 32K system, but what I'd actually done is I'd just plugged it into the serial port on the back of my Linux PC and fired up a Getty but I was actually logged into Linux on the Monotron. I was typing on the Monotron, using it as a proper old-fashioned serial terminal. That's the kind of fun I have in the evening. MIDI. At school, we had an Atari ST. Not as good as an Amiga, but it does have MIDI ports, which meant we could plug it into our Korg M1. Amazing. So I had to put MIDI on. Turns out MIDI is just another serial port. It's this technology that's been around for years, and I always wondered, I thought it was like magic notes just going through the cables. It's just a serial port, runs at 31,250 bits per second. I don't know why they picked that, it's a kind of a weird one, but it's just bytes. Um, but you just have to go through an opto isolator so you don't have ground loops. So basically the incoming signal goes into an LED, and the LED activates a transistor, and you buy those in a little package. So talk gets quite hardware at the end, bear with me. Uh, Real-time clocks. Real-time clocks are a nightmare because the batteries leak. If you like old-fashioned computers, you'll find the PCB has probably been eaten by leaky alkaline batteries, but the batteries are kind of useful because they keep some circuitry running while it's turned off. 
so it doesn't forget the time. If it keeps forgetting the time and all the parameters, kind of annoying. This chip has actually got a real-time clock on it with a battery-backed input. TI didn't bring it out on the dev board. The pin doesn't come off the chip. So on this board, I put down a real-time clock with a 32K crystal and there's space for a coin cell. I haven't actually put the coin cell on, on this example. Um, but yeah, I can tell the time. The um, oh, crystal, there's a whole other talk. Electronics is hard. Um, crystal capacitance, you fit a 32 kilohertz crystal, doesn't actually oscillate at 32 kilohertz. It's 32 kilohertz-ish, and you need to fit the correct capacitors either side of it to tune it. And if they're wrong, then it'll like gain or lose seconds a day. Uh, ask me in the bar afterwards. But the interface to it is pretty simple. It uses this thing called the inter-integrated circuit, or I squared C, and it's basically clock and data, and I can, I can exchange data, and it will tell me seconds, minutes, hours, month, day, year. I don't have to track the time. Chip does it for me. Chip costs about a buck. Why not? Just put it down. Super simple. Keyboards. I was determined to get the keyboard working, and you see I've got the keyboard going here. How did IBM fix this problem? Their, you know, their 8086 CPU must have been pretty busy. But it turns out, I put an extra CPU on the motherboard. The Intel keyboard controller, the 8042. Um, I like old computers. I'm not quite that retro. So I got myself an Atmel Atmega. So there's an Atmega on the board that's handling the keyboard. Um, it's handling the, the signals. The Atmega's got all these pins on it. Um, I've reused the crystal pins and the reset pin. Uh, that turned out to be a disaster because if you reprogram the reset pin to be I.O., you can't reset the chip anymore, which means you can't program it. Unless you take it out, put it in one of the 12-volt high-voltage programmers that just says, you will program, and reflash it that way. So, yeah, that was a problem. Anyway, there were loads of pins spare. I only need, like, two for the keyboard and mouse. Uh, sorry, two for the keyboard, two for the mouse, two to talk to the computer. I've got about 17 pins free. You know what else has 17 pins? Old-fashioned um, parallel printers. I had a dot matrix printer. I went, I wonder if I can drive a parallel printer from this. Um, and I think I, that bit of the schematic has yet to be proven, but if you have a look, you'll see there is a, a DB, it is actually B, a DB25 um, female connector on there, and I just need to write a bit of Atmel code. I'm pretty sure I can, um, I can print uh, I mean, I literally don't know why. There's a Hewlett-Packard office jet sat right next to it, which will, like, print, copy, scan, Wi-Fi, print Sudoku off the internet. This whole thing is an utter waste of time. Um, you know, what else would be fun? Inventing a programming language, because I clearly have loads of free time. I said that I didn't like BASIC, um, because it had line numbers. Well, this other example, Python, turns out MicroPython's really big. Um, and needs more than 32K of RAM. JavaScript, yeah, that's not going to happen. Uh, Pascal, wonderful three evenings spent researching the UCSD P code system, which was an entire operating system written to run on a virtual machine in 1982. You think JVM is a recent thing, it's old history. Um, so if I wrote a P-code interpreter, I could run the UCSD Pascal system where the compiler and the OS all written in P-code with this VM. An option? Yeah, maybe not. Um, Rex, old sort of command line language from IBM. I'm seeing a couple of nods in the audience. Um, the key thing for me was it was line-based. I didn't want a curly bracket language because curly brackets mean you can put new lines in wherever you like. And I haven't got enough memory for like a full screen text editor. I have to say, edit line six, edit the one line, so the entire line has to be complete syntactically, which means it's got to be like basic, where each line is like an if statement, a print statement. Um, some of these languages have that property, some of them don't. Um, a really interesting, obscure language called Euphoria. It was like a weird niche thing for ages. They open sourced it in about the mid-2000s. But it's a bit like basic, but it's got some sort of high level stuff in it. Yeah, maybe that could work. Um, or I'd just invent a new one from scratch. Um, I haven't implemented the interpreter yet. I have a parser, uh, Alexa, and I'm trying to work out how to interpret the abstract syntax tree. But it's a bit basic-ish, but I've got if, else if, and end if. I can create functions, end function. 
line numbers, I can sort of edit it line by line. It's sort of a mix between basic and Python, and maybe it'll take off, or maybe it's just a sad, tragic waste of, um, of my evenings. And so, what about 20 minutes left to do questions and a quick demo? You can go and find the source code online. Have a look at github.com slash the jpster. There's my crypto keys. Come and say hello afterwards. You see me in the blue t-shirt. Um, just come and say hi, grab a flyer. I've got loads of flyers. Please take a flyer. And hopefully this um, little trip through what I've been doing for you know, the past year or so has helped you just think about your code. If you are responsible for writing the two gigabyte Slack client, that seems to involve bundling a whole copy of Chromium for what is a text thing with like, Simon said this, I said fine. Maybe think about how you can do more with less. So, let's quit out. I mean, <laughs> I wasn't kidding, I'm just running on the, on the Monotron, so it's here and I can, you know, I can do directory listings and we can, we can load things, so we can... Uh, uh, I can type. We can load tiny basic. It's the goat. It's the basic program that everybody runs. Yay! <laughs> but the uh, the very observant in the audience will say, "Hey, you're running tiny basic originally for the sixty-eight thousand. That doesn't have floating point support." You suck, and you are correct. What you really want to do is run a copy of the 6502 basic in a 6502 emulator. <laughs> so welcome to 6502 enhanced basic. I believe it's sort of based around the original Microsoft basic. Um, we can tell it's um, enhanced basic because all the keywords now have to be in capital letters. But I do have floating point support. I mean, you saw it visibly took like half a second to calculate <laughs> because I am running a 6502 emulator. Um, and yeah, I've got that. So yeah, that works. So this is the bit where the video might break because the only way to get out of here is to reboot. So we'll see if this orange the light stays orange. Good. So one last demo to finish. Going to mount the SD card. Do my directory listing. We're going to play a little game. So let's do snake2.app. So what we're going to do is I'm going to play a little game of snake, and you're going to whoop and cheer every time I eat an apple. Apple. It's, it's an at letter. Okay, so I could remap the font. I haven't done it yet. Um, and then when I eventually come to my demise and eat my own tail or crash into the wall, um, you may show your thanks in the normal fashion. So to make this work, I have... <coughs> Does anybody recognize this? This is a really obscure piece of kit. This is a genuine Sega control stick for the Sega Master System. Normally they came with a gamepad, but joysticks are better. So, three channel wavetable synthesizer, I wasn't kidding. I was really proud of this tune until my wife said, why are you playing Bob the Builder all the time? I was like, what? I thought I came up with this myself. So, I'm going to stand here, whoop and cheer every time we eat an apple. Oh my goodness, the apples are invisible. This is really hard. Where, where is it? At the bottom. At the oh yeah, down there. Oh my goodness. This is going to be over quicker than I thought. Uh, oh, it's right by the edge. I stand here, I can almost... Ah, we're all over. Thank you. So there's a few minutes left, and if anyone wants to ask any questions, feel free. The question at the back. <laughs> yes, but I'd have to kill you first. <laughs> Actually, the floppy disk, it turns out, the way they emit their signals, it's, um, it's a mod modified FM signal, and you need a floppy controller, and all the floppy controllers are designed to fit in old IBM PCs, and the signaling is basically completely incompatible with an ARM. Um, 
But yeah, no, I, I hate you. <laughs> Any other questions that aren't going to upset me? Let's look over here. Okay, so interesting question. Could I plug a Commodore 64 tape deck in? Commodore 64 tape deck is an interesting one. Maybe a BBC or a Spectrum tape deck, no, because they're just analog, and this doesn't have an analog input. The Commodore 64 tape drive is interesting because it has digital outputs. The, um, the digital slicing of the signal is done in the tape deck, not the computer. Um, and so with a bit of interfacing, you probably could get the Commodore 64 code in here. Unfortunately, what this system can't do is emulate the really complicated sound chip and video chip that are specific to the Commodore 64. So while I could probably get the code in here, I couldn't run it unless it was like the most basic Commodore 64 program ever that just sort of added some numbers together. But yeah, interesting question. All right, next, at the back. So when you, you, you got your AM4600. Okay. Yep. Yep. So when you, when you say that, it's because you have to maintain a 600 because you can't go to like 800 by 300 because you need to match the scan of the monitor, is that is it right? So the question is, yeah, would... Okay, so the question is, why do I choose to do eight, um, 400 by 600 to halve the horizontal instead of halving the vertical? And the reason is, there's, I think it's 26.2 microseconds between here and here. And halving the number of vertical lines in my image does literally nothing to change the fact that it's 26.2 microseconds between here and here. It just gives me fewer lines. By halving the horizontal resolution, I only have half as many pixels to do in 26.2 microseconds. Um, my fonts, are, the font is actually from FreeBSD, and it's the bitmap font they use on Sun systems, I think, that don't have hardware VGA. And it's an eight by 16 font, but because I'm rendering all the pixels twice as wide as they should be, it turns into a square font. So they're actually, yeah, eight by 16, but they look square. Square text is kind of hard to read. It's got that sort of CGA feel to it, but we're really used to narrow letters. The wide letters, not, not as readable, but it is what it is. It works out instantly at 48 by 36 is the resolution once you take the, the border in for text mode. So if I could do the full, um, the full rate, 40 megahertz video, I could do 80 columns and then it starts to look a bit more like a PC. But yeah, if anyone wants to help, feel free. Anyone else? Yes. The dot app file, that is a very good question. Um, let's see if I can get out of this. I can show you exactly what's in an app file. Uh, let's do hello dot app, because it is short. So the very first four bytes are the init function pointer. So it's little endian, so 200022D, that is the pointer somewhere into this code which contains the init function. Uh, then I think it's put the data, then I think it's put the row data, and then I think it's put the text. But I, it's literally a copy of the bytes that go into RAM. So I'm not parsing ELF or any fancy file format. I literally just take the bytes off disk, put them in RAM, read the first four bytes, pretend it's a function pointer, that's seriously unsafe, by the way. Um, jump to it and then and then run it. So yeah, no real file file format at all. Uh, yes, so this is this is pre-compiled on my laptop, transferred over via the SD card. Yes. <laughs> Interesting question. Of so, for a virus to work, we would have to assume that the Rust operating system that I'd written has some sort of buffer overflow or other vulnerability that allows it to, um, to get runtime when I don't want it to. Um, interesting, I'm, if you're up for the challenge. <laughs> very, very, I, I, if, if there was a bug in the Rust-based FAT code, the SD card code, the SBI code, or the command line interface, 
that allowed a buffer overflow or stack overflow that gave you execution on the chip when it wasn't intended, then I would be really disappointed because that's sort of what Rust is there to avoid. So um, yeah, that'd be a challenge and I, I hope it's one that can't be done, but never say never. Anyone else? We all finished. All right, well, thank you very much. Oh. Sorry, could you repeat the question? So the NMS 600 resolution, you gave up on the 62 mark. Yep. So then you showed us that the timing issue could apply to the closing factory. Yep. Was, was there an opportunity perhaps to get 800 by 600 working? Okay, so the question is can I get 800 by 600 working? The problem is I've only got two clock cycles per pixel. So maybe if it was mono only, you could have like a high res mode, throw away the RGB, write the same value to red, to green and to blue, and then it would be always white or black. Um, maybe I seem to run into noise issues. At the time I was on the breadboard and pushing 40 megahertz down some pin wires in a breadboard was really pushing it from a noise point of view and the monitor wouldn't lock on. Maybe with the PCB, it's slightly better quality signal. Incidentally, you are supposed to use 75 ohm line amplifiers. I've just got three 330 ohm resistors and an HDMI converter, and this is just GPIO bit batching directly into the projector. Um, again, don't recommend it. It's completely outside the spec, and it's probably why it's a bit dim. But yeah, maybe I really want 80 column mode to work because then I could implement an 8086 emulator and run a copy of DOS 1, <laughs> maybe. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bit tight on memory. I, I think IBM sold a machine with 32K of RAM, but it was, yeah, it was a really loud. They also sold a machine with a built-in BASIC interpreter. Have you ever seen one? Yeah, you, IBM PCs used to boot to BASIC. Um, yeah, that'd be fun, wouldn't it? Leave it with me. The CPU clock speed is 80 megahertz, 8080, yep. Uh, there is another version of this board called the 129, which adds ethernet uh, and clocks at 120 megahertz and has, uh, instead of 32K of RAM, I think it's got 256K of RAM and um, a megabyte of flash. So it's not a lot more expensive, but a lot more power. Maybe there's room for a Monotron 256K with, you know, enhanced high-res support, six-channel wavetable. Um, who, who knows? Um, I may just get divorced before that. <laughs> <laughs> seriously need to stop doing this. Um, any more questions that aren't suggestions for how I could do more free unpaid work in my spare time? <laughs> All right, well, you've been lovely. Thank you very much.